Thanks very much. So um, I'm going to speak about Crohn's disease. It's a bit daunting to come as a, as a medical doctor and talk about when I feel like it's appropriate to operate on these patients. But what I did is put together um, what's known in, the, in, in uh, the literature about the natural history of this disease and try to answer some questions about looking at the data, why do these patients go to surgery, and what changes might have occurred uh, in the recent past with the advent of some of our newer, more effective therapies. Uh, as I put on the bottom of the slide here, I have nothing to disclose. So what I'm going to talk about this morning is I'm going to talk about briefly just one slide on the burden of Crohn's disease. How many patients do we see? Um, I'm then going to talk about uh, how often Crohn's disease patients go to surgery. I'm then really going to get into the meat of the talk, which is why these patients require surgery. What I'm going to tell you is that patients require surgery for three basic reasons. One is for refractory luminal disease. Another is for complications of refractory disease, such as stricturing or penetrating disease. The third, rarely patients go to surgery for cancer with this disease. Uh, and then I'm going to spend about four slides talking about have medications altered the natural history that I'm going to show you at the beginning of this talk. And then I'm going to wrap up uh, the above. So first of all, the burden of Crohn's disease. This I got from uh, Ed Loftus, who's, who works with us at the clinic, wrote a review and nicely summarized the prevalence and incidence uh, currently of Crohn's disease in the U.S. There currently is between four and 600,000 cases of Crohn's disease in the U.S. The incidence is somewhere around 10 to 45,000 new cases a year. There still is a slight female predominance, and as Dr. Salky mentioned in his opening comments, the peak age of incidence is in young people between 20 uh, and 40 years of age. So how often do patients require surgery? The panel on the left is a study that we did uh, at Mayo in 2001 where we looked at patients, uh, our, our population of patients that required steroids for their disease and then followed, the, followed them retrospectively over the next year. And we found, quite to our surprise really, that nearly four in 10 patients within the first year of requiring steroids uh, uh, went to surgery for their disease. So that was shocking to us that patients went to surgery as frequently as they did. If you look then um, at four different population-based studies, these are older studies and then updated studies, both from the Olmstead County database at Mayo as well as uh, the Copenhagen population-based database. You'll find that roughly 60% of patients, on average within 20 years of following their disease, require surgery. So it's an extremely common problem. Why do patients go to surgery? As I mentioned in my opening slide, patients go to surgery for refractory disease, penetrating or fibrostenosing disease, and malignant complications. Well, why do patients go to surgery for refractory disease? Main thing is that long-term remission is quite uncommon uh, in Crohn's disease, and that's what this slide is meant to show. These are two studies, uh, one from the population at Olmstead County at Mayo, another, again, from a Scandinavian study. And what I'm meaning to show in this panel is that while at any one point in time, the majority of patients are in either post-surgical or medically induced remission at any one point in time, patients tend to oscillate in and out of, uh, uh, out of disease activity states from remission to moderate to severely active disease. So long-term remission is, is quite uncommon with only 10% of patients remaining in long-term remission and the vast majority have a chronic intermittent course. Well, how often does refractory disease occur? To answer this question, what I did was look through the literature and pull studies that showed at least one year outcome after medically induced remission. And what I tried to pool here is that if you look at three, class, three of our most effective classes of agents for um, uh, Crohn's disease, thiopurines, and then methotrexate, as well as infliximab, an anti-TNF biologic. If you look at one year down the road after medically induced remission, maintenance of that remission is typically between 40 and 60 percent. So that means roughly half the patients, upon achieving medically induced remission with these effective agents, do not maintain remission over the course of a year. What I'm showing here is that with this um, oscillating disease activity state and our inability to, uh, to get complete and long-lasting remission, patients tend to have an increasing frequency of uh, internal penetrating and fibrostenosing disease over time. So this is from uh, Jacques Cohn, uh, a, a regional um, uh, referral center in France. And what they published here, it shows that over 20 years following their cohort of patients, the incidence of inflammatory disease, which is in the yellow column, tends to fall over time, while the incidence of stricturing disease, which is the green column, and the, and the, uh, and the uh, rise of penetrating disease, which is the red column, tend to increase over time. 
So while uh, as these patients continue with intermittent refractory disease, they begin to develop the complications of that, which is uh, primarily stricturing and penetrating disease. Well, what about uh, uh, perforating complications? Two population-based studies have looked at perforating complications of Crohn's disease. One published in 1980, which is another Scandinavian study, and then David Schwartz, when he was at Mayo, published this in 2002. And what both studies showed is that over 20 years of disease, perhaps one in four patients will have perianal disease, and then Dave went on and looked at any fistulizing disease and found roughly half of patients, 50% of patients at 20 years, developed any penetrating complications. Dave went on and looked at uh, the natural history of that penetrating disease and found that roughly one in three patients developed recurrent disease, and the median time to recurrence was about 2.8 years. So is there any way that we can predict at the outset which patients might develop more complicated disease? I think there are some hints on the horizon that, we, that we'll be able to do this. The first uh, study that I show here is published also by the same French group, um, uh, by Beaujolais et al. in gastroenterology in 2006. And what they showed, what, what they did is they looked at, again at their, at their database and, uh, and tried to come up with variables that might predict what they defined as complicated disease in five years. And the variables that they found were predictive of complicated disease were those patients that developed disease at young age, so young onset, patients with perianal disease or penetrating disease, and patients that required steroids at presentation. Um, the last two studies that I show here are both out of Cedar sinai uh, Steph Targan um, at UCLA Cedar sinai has had a long-standing interest in finding serologic markers of Crohn's disease and also ulcerative colitis. And what they've done, they've got an enormous cohort of serum and uh, data on patients that they follow. And what, what they published here in Gastro in 2005 is that patients, in, in general, if you don't follow this literature, in general, patients with Crohn's disease and to some degree ulcerative colitis tend to have a higher incidence of serologic markers um, against bacterial antigen. Things such as CBR1, which is against the dominant antigen of flagellin, uh, OMPC, ASCA, and ANCA, which people are familiar with. ANCA is not a bacterial. But, um, but anyway, what, what they published in Gastro 2005 was that patients that had serologic immune responses to bacterial antigen, in particular CBR1, which is again the dominant antigen uh, for flagellated bacteria, uh, was associated with complicated Crohn's disease. That was a retrospective study. Marla Dubinsky, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist also at UCLA Cedar sinai published then in the American Journal of Gastroenterology in 2006, prospectively in children, that the more of these markers these children had, the more likely they were to develop uh, complicated disease or rapid disease progression. So this is really the first hint that we have that we might be able to predict which patients may develop complicated disease in the future. So moving now to the last of that three-point bullet, malignancy. How often does cancer really occur? That is quite uncommon. Uh, these are all the population-based studies that have been performed looking at colorectal cancer and Crohn's disease. And what you see is that uh, two databases, uh, the Olmsted County database, as well as Chuck Bernstein's database in Canada, uh, I'm sorry, in three, uh, and then one in Sweden, all showed there to be a slight increased um, uh, relative risk of colorectal cancer and Crohn's disease, um, somewhere around two. Uh, this study in Birmingham was not a true population-based study. Other studies have not shown there to be an increased risk of, of, of uh, colorectal cancer and Crohn's disease. Most of us believe that there is uh, a, a slight increased risk in patients with Crohn's colitis and therefore survey those patients as we would patients with ulcerative colitis. What about small bowel cancer? Well, as one might expect, there is a, 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 uh, quite a high increase in relative risk in small bowel adenocarcinoma. That being said, each one of these databases, though, have very small, have very small numbers of cases, uh, which, which speaks for the fact that this is such an unusual cancer. So I've talked to you quite a bit about a bleak, uh, really a bleak treatment history of Crohn's disease and our inability to keep patients in long-term remission. Um, what about with the advent of newer medications? Have we been able to change what, what the natural history is as I've described it? Um, this first study, again published by the French group, uh, Jacques Cohn, published in Gut in 2005, would suggest that no, we haven't changed uh, the natural history of this disease. Natural history studies require firm endpoints, such as surgery, such as death, uh, such as hospitalization rates, etc. And so what this study was, again, looking at their uh, cohort of patients um, and looking at the natural history is defined by the number of surgical cases per 100 patients. 
Well, one can see essentially from 1984 to 2002, there was no significant change in the numbers of surgeries uh, per 100 patients. The authors made the point that from 1992 on, roughly half the patients were on immunomodulatory therapy, the thiopurines or methotrexate. So one of the take-home messages from this paper was that uh, we haven't been able to make much of a difference. Sub-analyses of two recent studies have shown that perhaps we have been able to make a difference. So these are, the, these are studies on, uh, on the biologic anti-TNF um, drug infliximab. The first study is the Accent 1 trial, and this is a sub-analysis of that Accent 1 trial, which was an efficacy trial in active Crohn's disease. And what this sub-analysis looked at was the uh, rates of hospitalization and the rates of uh, surgery in patients that either received episodic anti-TNF agent or received scheduled drug, 5 milligrams per kilo every eight weeks, or a higher dose, 10 milligrams per kilo every eight weeks. And what this panel clearly shows is that patients that receive scheduled maintenance infusions of, uh, of drug, either at 5 or the 10 milligram per kilo dose, had substantially decreased rates of hospitalization as well as decreased rates of surgery, suggesting that uh, the newer, more effective biologic therapy uh, does give us the opportunity to change this natural history. Another sub-analysis study now in fistulizing Crohn's disease shows similar data. In this study, patients were followed uh, in a maintenance trial with either maintenance drug, 5 milligrams per kilo, or placebo. And what we can see here, uh, then on the left axis, are hospitalization rates, and uh, in this panel, again, all surgeries and procedures. One can see that the patients that received placebo, when compared to patients that received drug, had substantially increased rates of hospitalization, as well as surgeries, again suggesting that potentially we can alter the natural history. So those are the clear indications for surgery, okay? Symptomatic fibrostenosing disease, perineal sepsis I didn't touch on, but that's a clear indication for surgery, cancer. Well, what about less clear indications? What about internal perforating disease? What I've summarized is the literature on surgical versus percutaneous drainage of intra-abdominal abscesses related to Crohn's disease. And while I'm not going to go through these studies in detail, the points that I want to make in this is that all of these studies are retrospective, all of these studies are small, and in general, regardless of how you define success, whether patients stay free of surgery for 30 days, whether they get out of the hospital, whether they're, they, they're free of surgery for a year, success is about 50-50 if you drain these radio, uh, radiologically or if you drain them with surgery. The, the, the harbingers of potential success might be the first abscess that a patient has, smaller abscesses, spontaneous abscesses rather than post-surgical abscesses, and fewer associated fistulae. Now, moving into even a uh, less clear area. So I'm going to present three cases, because anytime you go to speak to surgeons, everybody tells me you need to present cases. So I've got three cases here uh, that are inflammatory masses without clear abscess formation. And this is really where the art of practice comes in and where I would emphasize over and over again why a close collegial relationship with your gastroenterologist and your surgeon is absolutely required to manage these complicated patients. So this was a patient referred to me out of the hospital who was 18 years of age, had gone to the hospital with right lower quadrant abdominal pain, fever, leukocytosis, had a family history of Crohn's disease. In retrospect, um, when you evaluate this young man, he'd had several months of intermittent obstructive symptoms. This was his initial CAT scan in the emergency room, which shows this large inflammatory mass in the right lower quadrant. There's a little bit of gas there, but there was no obvious abscess. So uh, the patient was referred after getting IV antibiotics overnight um, to me. He was actually feeling quite well. We continued him on antibiotics, performed colonoscopy, confirmed the diagnosis of Crohn's disease, and then after seeing him in consultation with the surgeon, decided to treat him with two months of outpatient antibiotics, six weeks of topically active budesonide, uh, and we saw, him back this, uh, we saw him back then on March 14th, and this is the resolution of this inflammatory mass then over that two to three month period. We then began anti-TNF therapy, and he continues to be well to this date. This is another case, an inflammatory mass without abscess. This is a 29-year-old uh, patient with nine months of obstructive symptoms, diarrhea. Uh, she had gone to the emergency room with pain. She had um, outside CT scans and small bowel x-rays that she brought to her visit with me uh, that showed this inflammatory mass here and multiple uh, interloop fistulae. Um, similar strategy, uh, I saw her in conjunction with one of our colorectal surgeons. We treated her with a week of antibiotics. We began anti-TNF therapy five months, uh, we began anti-TNF therapy a week later, and five months later this patient is asymptomatic off prednisone. 
Last case, without such a rosy story, this is uh, another middle-aged gentleman, 33 years old, with an eight-year history of Crohn's disease. He presented with Crohn's disease with perforation in 1998, uh, and he required surgery at that time. He'd had several months of obstructive symptoms. He was on prednisone, a liquid diet, 40-pound weight loss, but he had no fever or peritoneal signs. Again, you can see this large right lower quadrant inflammatory mass without uh, obvious associated abscess. Similar program, we treated him with a couple of weeks of, of oral antibiotics. We started him on anti-TNF therapy. While he had a remarkable clinical response, and I saw him back two months later, he was doing great, uh, he returned nine months later with just this nagging um, uh, partial small bowel obstructive symptoms. So uh, this patient ultimately went to surgery and now is clinically doing well. So what's the point of me showing these three cases? The point is that all patients were seen concomitantly with our colorectal surgeons. All patients received antibiotics. There was an extremely deliberate and methodical approach to the use of immunosuppressive therapy in these patients. And these patients had extremely close follow-up. So in conclusion then, the natural history of Crohn's disease. Surgery is common. It's frequently complicated by post-operative recurrence. If you use surgery as an outcome variable, there's been no substantial change in the natural history over the last 35 years. Um, perhaps these data reflect practice patterns uh, that are pre the full impact of biologic therapy, and ongoing studies are going to be able to answer that question more fully. So to answer the question that I was asked to come here to talk about, when is surgery appropriate? In my opinion, surgery is appropriate when you have symptomatic, fibrotic, non-inflammatory strictures. If you have perineal sepsis, which occurs in about one in four patients, if you look uh, throughout 20 years of their disease course, it can occur for refractory inflammatory disease, which, looking at the data, might be in approximately half patients. It can occur uh, unusually for cancer, and surgery may be appropriate for intra-abdominal penetrating disease. My point to putting this on the slide, though, is that your gastroenterologist and your surgeon must maintain a close relationship and management of these patients uh, because these patients are complicated, they're sick, uh, and, uh, and the art of practice of these really requires that close working relationship. Thanks very much.